I'm going to talk to you about how the Vikings might have used polarized light to navigate across the uh, North Atlantic. Now, the Vikings have uh, you know, captured the public imagination for centuries. And even now, you know, right from comic strips like Hagar the Horrible to if you're, if you're an aficionado of rock and roll music, the Led Zeppelin even has a song about the Vikings called the Immigrant Song. I was hoping to play it for you, but you can listen to it on iTunes when you get home. Um, <clears throat> so the Vikings had a, you know, um, had a justifiable reputation for being brutal and rapacious, but nonetheless, you know, they had a crucial role in uh, in the formation of modern Europe, and we still use a lot of. Uh, uh, a uh, lot of their terms, some of, for example, our uh, the Wednesday, Thursday, and Fridays come from Viking gods and so on. And um, in fact, Kenneth Clark, the historian in civilization, says that uh, the sheer technical skill of the journeys is a new achievement of the Western world. And you have to realize that the highlight of the Viking epoch was from around 800 to 1100 uh, AD. And uh, they, they were wonderful in sailing. They built these so-called longboats, and, um, they, you know, and th this is from the Bayou Tapestry from the Middle Ages, which shows Vikings making a longboat. And at the bottom, they show, uh, show, the, show a flotilla of Viking ships. Except that uh, the artist had one thing wrong. Viking sails were square. So now. The top figure is actually from the US Department of Justice building on 10th and Constitution Avenue in DC. So if you go to DC, you can check it out. It shows a Viking flotilla uh, um, out up here uh, with the North Star uh, over here. And, uh, but there's something wrong with it. It has been somewhat Americanized. Usually the, the pro has a dragon, but this one has the US American Eagle there. <laughs> And, and uh, you know, the, the unmanned helm has been displaced on the port side. And in fact, if you're a sailor or you own a boat, starboard actually comes from a Viking Norse uh, term. So the Vikings were wonderful navigators. And here's something from a from medieval manuscript showing the Vikings, uh, 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 Viking ship. Now, this figure shows some of the early voyages coming from northern Scandinavia. They went all around, including the, you know, going past the Straits of Gibraltar uh, out here and um, going all around Europe and, in, and down the Volga and the Danube, all the way down to Constantinople. In fact, the Ottoman kings had um, Vikings as their bodyguards at the Hagia Sophia in, in Constantinople. They traded with the Arabs, and you'd be surprised to learn, it was a surprise to me, that even the name Russia comes from the name of a Viking tribe called the Rus. So, so there's a lot to talk about, but this talk, I'm mainly going to concentrate on the North Atlantic journeys of the Vikings. Um, how did they get uh, involved in this? There were a couple of French scientists who actually contacted me about some questions on polarization and human vision. And we got, you know, we published a couple of papers on this. And we figured, OK, somehow they got interested in this. And I'll tell you the story about it later on as we go. Uh, this figure actually shows some of the major uh, uh, early voyages of the Vikings, as well as the Atlantic currents. So leaving from approximately Bergen in uh, Norway, the Vikings uh, discovered, uh, in their early voyages, discovered Iceland, and then went on to, to discover Greenland. Eric the Red uh, was a famous Viking leader. In fact, established a colony there in Greenland. And uh, in fact, he called it Greenland. Green, I suppose, to induce other people to come and settle his colony. <laughs> Okay, but that is Eric the Red. But more importantly, his son Leif, Leif Erikson, you know, Eric's 
son, um, actually sailed forth from, from Greenland and went over into what is now called Vinland, or what they call Vinland and what is now called Newfoundland and uh, Nova Scotia in Canada. In fact, Viking coin, they might have even gone further south, we don't know, but there was trade between the Viking colonies in Newfoundland and Maine because Norse coins have been discovered in Maine. So, so there's a lot of interest in this. And, um, and in fact, if you go to Newfoundland, oh, this shows you a more detailed map of some of the Vinland voyages and it gives you the times, you know, from around, uh, you know, 983 all the way up to, you know, uh, 1015 or so where some of the early voyages were done. And uh, in fact, if you go to Lance or Meadows in Newfoundland, you can find Viking ruins. These have been reconstructed, of course, but you know, there are plenty of ruins. And um, it's, I've never been there, though I'd love to go there sometime. But this is, uh, so there is plenty of evidence that the Vikings did arrive in the New World, as it was called, almost five centuries before Columbus did. So, this figure again from a, 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 this is from around the 15th century. It shows a picture of Eric the Red from a medieval manuscript. But of course, he's wearing medieval armaments, which he would not have worn, but in a minor detail. Uh, now, there is a famous uh, Viking story called the Greenlanders Saga. And it's a, it's a long saga, but, but in it, hidden in there where, this, where you see this P is the hidden amongst the uh, saga with only a decorated P to mark its beginnings. There are two sagas talking about the Norse discovery of North America. Okay, And uh, in fact, this is from a mid 14th century vellum manuscript and you can, you can find it. In fact, the Smithsonian had a big uh, exhibit of Vikings um, uh, about 10 years ago, and they had a wonderful catalog of it, which is where I took these pictures from. Um, so once again, these are the Viking voyages as the Lance or Meadow and the various uh, Viking routes. So the question is this, how did they navigate across the Atlantic? There I am in my Viking regalia showing Lee Ferrickson which way to go. Okay. <laughs> Oh, uh, by the way, the Viking helmets did not have the horns. Uh, they, the Vikings were the last to be Christianized. They resisted Christianity for a long, long time. So various, uh, so various uh, Christian manuscripts and others painted horns on them to make them look like the devil. So, okay. So the major question is, how did they navigate across the Atlantic? Now. Did they use a magnetic compass or a sextant? You know, these are common tools used for navigation, except that the compass was not invented in Europe until the 13th century. <coughs> However, you might be interested to know that the Han Dynasty in China actually knew about the magnetic compass almost a thousand years before. Okay. So that did not work. So we can rule out the compass. And also, if you are at that high a latitude near the magnetic pole, you're going to get fluctuations in your magnetic readings anyway. So the compass is not one of those things. Did they use navigational charts? We have no evidence of navigational charts. They probably didn't use navigational charts. And of course, one could uh, think of an early version of triptychs. I think most of you in the audience know what these are. I don't know if they still make them, but um, and of course they didn't use GPS. <laughs> right. So there are different types of navigation. One is celestial navigation, which is using the positions of sun, uh, stars, and, and, and the moon. One could use uh, what is called pilotage, or, uh, which uses landmarks and navigational aids. There's dead reckoning. In dead reckoning implies you navigate only using instruments such as uh, a map and compass, as opposed to live reckoning, which is what celestial navigation is. Uh, 
then there are other types like waypoint navigation, position fixing, radar, sonar, and so on. The ancient uh, navigators all used the top three. Um, the others are more recent. Now, obviously, for the Vikings, the sun would have been a very obvious source or uh, reference point during their long westerly voyages. They only went east-west, especially during the long uh, during the summers when the uh, daylight hours are are long. But one can argue at those latitudes, even during the summers, the North Atlantic is covered with fog and clouds. And during the winter and fall months, it becomes even more problematic because of the short times and uh, short winter days. So the basic question is, what technologies did the Vikings use for going across the vast, turbulent uh, waters and the cloudy skies of the North Atlantic? Now, in the ancient days, navigation was more of an art than a science. The navigator had to apply a lot of different uh, pieces of information to the problem of guiding a ship from its origin to the destination. Now, if you look at the Norse legends, it talks about uh, that the Viking uh, or which is Norse for navigator, he carved the sea with the pro. And, you know, the Vikings had a reputation, a well-deserved reputation for being expert, uh, expert uh, navigators. And so what did they use? There is archaeological evidence. For example, what I show on the right-hand side is 11th century incised wooden disc. And historians believe that reinforces the notion that the Vikings used astronomical observation for, uh, uh, for navigation. They used the orientation relative to the sun, and people have gone and you know, made uh, such uh, devices from, the, uh, from this. It's called the Unar talk. And um, so there is some evidence that they did use uh, observations of the sky, especially the sun. But still, the basic problem is, how did they find the position of the sun, when, especially when, uh, when the skies are cloudy and there's fog, and you know, it's very hard to tell the exact position of the sun? So the answer to that question comes from this. I'm holding in my hand a crystal. We'll talk more about this in a, in a short while. The answer comes from something like this. They used optics of some kind. And the answer to that actually came from a, uh, 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 from a Danish archaeologist called Ramsku, uh, who in 1967 said that they probably used some kind of a crystal uh, called which he called as coderite, which you can find in abundance in Greenland and Iceland. And of course, there's something called Icelandic spar or calcite crystals and so on. And Viking legends are filled with stories of how King Olaf, shown here, uh, uh, the weather was thick and stormy. The king looked about and saw no blue sky. Then the king took the sunstone and held it up, and then he saw where the sun beamed from the stone. They called it the sunstone. And there are numerous references to the sunstone in all the Viking legends. And that's what I, uh, uh, I'm going to talk about. Uh, we think that the sunstone was really a quartz crystal. Okay. Now, what uh, Ramsku suggested was somehow the Vikings were able to look at the polarization of the sky. What do I mean by polarization? I'm going to tell you in a few minutes uh, uh, about, uh, I'm going to talk about light, and then we'll talk about something called polarization. But this idea of using somehow the, quote, polarization of the sky uh, is not new. In fact, back in 1948, this uh, physicist, Fund, who was at Johns Hopkins, he also was a president of the Optical Society of America later on, um, patented something called a sky compass, which determined 
the polarization of the sky and hence the sun. Um, now, it was used, for example, by the United States Air Force on flights over the North Pole where magnetic uh, compass were unreliable. And later in the 1950s, oh, and Fund used to uh, uh, did this when he was at the National Bureau of Standards, which is now called NIST. Then SAS, appropriately enough, the Scandinavian Air System, had flights across the North Pole from Scandinavia, from Copenhagen to New York. And this was, I'm talking about late 40s, early 50s. Uh, so SAS for, uh, for uh, polar flights used something called a Coleman Sky Compass, which was also based upon detection of polarization of the sky. So there is evidence for this. So I have spoken to you about polarization. Uh, but before I talk to you, explain to you what polarization means, I have to talk to you about what is light. Okay? Um, so I'm going to give you a brief tour of, of what light is, what we call as light. And, and before the 19th century, uh, thanks to Isaac Newton, uh, we believed that light consisted of particles or corpuscles. And we thought that light traveled in straight lines. It's an approximation, but a good enough approximation if you're designing optical systems, lenses, and so on. That was all due to Newton. But in the first half of the 19th century, uh, there was considerable evidence that light is actually a wave, like a water wave or a sound wave. And the crucial evidence for that light is a wave came from a gentleman called Thomas Young. In fact, Thomas Young was so brilliant that there is a biography of Thomas Young called The Last Man Who Knew Everything. It's a fascinating biography because Thomas Young not only worked on, on light, uh, in fact, the Young double slit experiment has been, is considered to be one of the greatest experiments of all time. It's a very simple experiment. People have done uh, the Young double slit with electrons and so on to show the wave nature of matter. It's, it's a beautiful, very simple experiment to do. Uh, but Thomas Young also contributed to material science. If you are dealing with strength of materials, you talk about something called the Young's modulus. He worked on actuarial tables. He played a role in deciphering hieroglyphics. For, uh, so, I mean, he was all over the place. Okay? And uh, then Fresnel, uh, who, was, uh, who was a contemporary, also sh showed uh, examples that light diffracts, meaning that it goes around corners and so on, and that light was also a wave. So there was a lot of evidence that light behaved like in a wave, uh, um, as a wave phenomena. Then came, uh, later in the 19th century, uh, Faraday and Hertz and, uh, 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 and others showed that light is part of what we call an electromagnetic spectrum, part of the electromagnetic spectrum, like your radio waves or radar waves and so on, and that the speed of light was equal to the speed of electromagnetic radiation. And, uh, and then in the early 20th century, of course, there was uh, Albert Einstein who showed that light consists of particles or what are called photons, something called the photoelectric effect, which you all know your garage openers, door openers, and all use the photoelectric effect. And Max Planck and um, you know, thought that light came in discrete packets of energy called photons. But the great synthesis uh, going back to the, uh, to the uh, 19th century was done by James Clerk Maxwell who wrote down, who achieved one of the first big unifications in physics. You know that the, that the grand quest in physics is something called unification, you know, trying to get together a unified theory that looks into all the forces of nature. But Maxwell achieved one of the first very, show, very unified electricity and magnetism. Oops. So today the accepted picture is 
uh, light has a dualistic nature. It's uh, both a particle and a wave. Uh, and what we call as light is usually electromagnetic radiation that's visible to the human eye, which is from around 400 uh, nanometers to 700 nanometers. And light has uh, properties of both waves and particles. So for the rest of the talk, in order to describe polarization, I'm going to confine myself to the idea that light is a wave. So light consists of both uh, an electric field, shown, say, for example, by the red, and a magnetic field by the blue. They are both vibrating very fast, traveling at 186,000 miles per second in air, and, um, and they vibrate rapidly. And uh, both the electric field vibrations and the magnetic field uh, vibrations are at right angles to each other and right angles to the direction in which light is moving. Normally at optical frequencies, normally at uh, 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 you know, the visible light range, we, we, you know, we omit the magnetic field and look at only the electric field variations. And in fact, what Maxwell achieved could be put on a t-shirt. And in fact, I have a t-shirt which has Maxwell equations, but my wife told me I shouldn't wear it for this lecture, that I should be more presentable. Um, so, you, so these are the Maxwell equations. And generally, you know, Maxwell equations are three-dimensional, and you can describe them by a vector. For those of you in the audience who know what a vector is, if you don't, don't worry about it. And um, essentially what happens is, we are going to now talk about if you can normally unpolarize light, like light coming from uh, from the incandescent light there, is uh, is unpolarized, meaning that these vibrations are in all directions. But if you confine the vibrations of the electric field to a specific plane, you call the light to be polarized light. For example, in here, I've confined the electric field to only vibrate up and down, okay? Now, I can show it uh, with this little demo. Assume that this is, a, this is an electromagnetic wave. If I make it vibrate up and down, I have these two slits here, and it can go up and down, no problem at all, right? So light is polarized. Uh, vertically. Now, how do you, if this is unpolarized light, um, I can put a piece of Polaroid, okay, a Polaroid is, uh, is a material that allows these vibrations in only one plane. So, this is called a polarizer, and I can take another piece of Polaroid called an analyzer, and if the, if the two are aligned, the vibrations can go through, as you can see. On the other hand, if I put them this way, where this allows only vertical vibrations and this does not allows only horizontal vibrations, you'll see that it doesn't go through. Okay? So I'm going to show you something that is uh, much simpler to do. Do I turn this on? Is there a switch in here? See, unpolarized light. This is my Polaroid. Okay, I'm getting polarized light. Now I take another piece of Polaroid in here, and as I rotate it, you should be able to see that the brightness varies. That's because at one point it's going to be a minimum. That's the same situation as there. Because this Polaroid allows light in only one plane of vibration, and then this one is perpendicular to it, so you don't get anything coming out, okay? So polarized light, oops, thank you. So polarized light has many uses, and uh, <coughs> well, before, before I talk about it, this is essentially what I said. The polarization state describes, you know, the movement pattern of the electric field vector, and we classify polarization as being linear or uh, circular or elliptical, depending upon how the electric field uh, is confined. 
And we also talk about what is called the degree of polarization, meaning how big a portion of the light is polarized. It need not be, you know, light can be fully unpolarized, light can be fully polarized, but there can be states in between also. And polarization has very many applications. Sunglasses. Why do polarized sunglasses work so well? When light reflects off, say, a water surface or something, it is partially polarized. And that's what you see as glare. Your polarized sunglasses cuts out that glare, it's just by the principle I showed you here. Uh, you all go to movies, 3D movies. They give you these glasses to wear. Those are polaroid glasses. Essentially, you take the same picture with different, uh, slightly shifted apart. You, know, you need this horizontal disparity with two different uh, polarization filters in front of the two cameras so that you, know, you get the same effect. Uh, LCDs, polarization is used, for example, for doing stress tests uh, on plastic and so on and so forth. So polarization is an intrinsic property of light. We can create polarized light by scattering light, by sending it through uh, specific materials like the Polaroid and so on. So the question is, if the Vikings navigated using polarized light, where did they get the polarized light first? Uh, uh, when it's called Rayleigh scattering, and I will, I'll, I'll tell you that in, a, in two more slides, but first I want to, uh, to show you this. So is the biological system, is your eye sensitive to polarized light is the next question. It so happens that many species of animals are sensitive to polarized light. For example, the cuttlefish shown over there on the right-hand side. Uh, lots of migrating birds, honeybees, uh, 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 butterflies, they, they're all sensitive to polarized light. In fact, there have been a number of studies that show that uh, uh, animals, birds, use polarized light in the atmosphere to, to migrate, to navigate. So the question is, do human beings, can they do that? Human beings are somewhat sensitive to polarized light. Where does the polarization sensitivity come from in an animal? You know that light gets trapped in the photoreceptor cells of the eye. Uh, you have these pigment molecules that absorb these light photons. But these, light for, but these pigment molecules are specifically aligned with a certain specific orientation, okay? which is how the polarization sensitivity comes in. Human beings are sensitive somewhat to polarized light, but not really. Um, a physicist, uh, Heidinger, back in 1844, showed uh, uh, this polarization sensitivity in human beings. It, they're called Heidinger's brushes. And essentially what Heidinger's brushes are is the following. If you look at a clear blue patch of sky away from the sun, you will be able to see, under some conditions, you have to look at, it, so look at a specific area. You'll see a faint, hazy, bow tie shaped pattern as shown over there. Okay, um, and uh, you know it's it's kind of fuzzy. Some people even see a little purplish uh, uh, hue around the yellow, but this is called Heidinger's brushes. It's approximately, if you look out in space, it sub, it will subtend. If you're looking at the dot right at the center, the Heidinger's brushes phenomenon will subtend about you know four to five degrees of visual angle, and uh, and Heidinger's brushes can also be seen if you're working with an LCD flat panel computer screen. If you're looking at the white area of the screen, uh, you might be able to see some of this. Except that uh, I've never been able to see it. But, okay, I'm just being honest. Um, uh, you can, uh, people who have seen it say that it is often diagonal. 
So there is some sensitivity. And the reason I'm taking you through this is because uh, my story is somehow the Vikings knew something about polarization, and they were able to use that. Now, if you look at the uh, polarization pattern, uh, the, the polarization uh, vector would be perpendicular to the yellow bow tie. The, polar, the plane of polarization, as it's called, would be perpendicular to the bow tie. And so we are now going to talk about what this crystal does, this piece of calcite crystal does. How? Um, many of you know about refraction. Refraction is, have you ever noticed that if you have a glass of water and you stick a pencil in it, the pencil appears to be bent? That's called refraction from the Latin for fracture. And in fact, I have a nice demo of this. Can you turn down the lights, please? I have through here. See, here's my light coming straight through. And uh, some of it is being reflected. But if you look inside the block, you'll see that it is bent. OK? That's light being refracted. Now, certain crystals do what is called birefringence or double refraction. What it means is the following. If I ha this is a this is a piece of calcite. It's a calcite crystal, CaCO3. And if I take a laser beam and I shine a piece of calcite crystal into it, oops, shine it through calcite. What you should be able to see, oops, am I getting it? Ah, there. You are able to see two spots, even though one spot hits. In fact, it will be better on here. Is that on? Uh, OK, yeah. Thank you. Now, you'll see that on this piece of paper, I got these letter O's. Now I put my piece of calcite on there. You see a double image? Okay, this is, see? All I'm doing is just varying my uh, calcite crystal. And you see this double image. This is called double refraction or birefringence. What happens is, yeah. What happens is, when a, when a beam of light, unpolarized, enters a calcite crystal, it's split into two beams. Uh, one is called the ordinary ray. The ordinary ray is like what I showed you uh, here. It's ordinary refraction. There is also something called the extraordinary ray. Now. <clears throat> These rays move at different speeds. You have, a, you have a fast component and a slow wave. And essentially what happens is both these rays are polarized oppositely. They are opposite polarization. So for example, in this figure, this shows exactly the same experiment I showed you. I have the letter A, and you get two different letters. The vertical image is the extraordinary ray. And now if I put a polarizer in front with the axis oriented in the same direction, the ordinary image disappears. And here, the extraordinary image disappears. So these crystals are called anisotropic crystals. Uh, and, and, the, and it's called birefringence or uh, double refraction. So 
like I said before, there are many ways to produce polarized light, and one of them is through the use of calcite. In fact, people use this uh, in many applications. And this is exactly what I uh, uh, showed you. I have a laser light hitting a calcite crystal, and I'll get two spots, uh, an ordinary image and an extraordinary image. So the hypothesis is that calcite could have been the sunstone. How will it be used? Now, the first question we have to answer is, is the sky polarized? And the answer to that was given by, by Lord Rayleigh, who showed that when light scatters off objects, it is going to be polarized or partially polarized. It's called Rayleigh scattering, named after him. And, and the reason, uh, 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 the reason the sky, in fact, one of the reasons the sky is blue is because the scattering uh, varies as the uh, uh, you know inverse fourth power of the wavelength. I have. Basically, what it means is short wavelengths like blue are scattered more towards you, and long wavelengths uh, are not. And so. This is a, there's a very strong dependence of Rayleigh scattering uh, uh, at short wavelengths. But even more important for our purposes is this. If you have unpolarized light coming in, it hits uh, you know, uh, water molecules in, like in fog and in clouds, whatever. It is scattered. And the light coming towards you is going to be horizontally polarized if you're standing directly underneath. And in fact, we have a demo here to show uh, such scattering. What we really have here is, OK. What we really have here is water with some drops of milk in it. And you can see. Here's the source of light, and there's light scattering. So I'm creating really an artificial sunset or sunrise. But even more important, I'm going to take a piece of Polaroid and show you that the light is uh, polarized. If you look over there, you'll see that the intensity is going to vary. Everyone see that? OK. OK? So light, scattered light, is being polarized. So how, how could we use it? So this is what I, I was demonstrating now. Light coming from the sun, it scatters particles. If you're directly underneath the scattering particle, you're going to see plain polarized light. How can you use it for navigation? Remember, what was our main goal? Our main goal was how could the Vikings know where the sun was, even under very thick fog and cloud conditions? So we need to know the position of the sun. So if you had a polarizer, obviously, you, know, you could do something like what I showed you and determine where the sun was, because it's going to be at 90 degrees from where you're viewing with a polarizer. Um, so in order to further answer this question, we need to look at the polarization patterns in ve under very heavy cloud cover, under fog, and so on. And in fact, this is what uh, Horvath, who is a physicist in, in Hungary, who has published a lot on this and on polarization in animals, Basically, what he did was he used something called a polarimeter, a sophisticated device that can measure the polarization pattern uh, 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 from samples. He went on a ship, went to the uh, Arctic, and measured the polarization pattern and the degree of polarization of the light uh, under Arctic skies. So S1 through S8 were taken under, uh, in the Arctic under varying degrees of, of fog and cloud cover. S9 through S15 were taken in, in Hungary, in Budapest, 
with the varying degrees of uh, clouds and so on. So in terms of navigation, what you need is uh, the degree of uh, linear polarization should be reasonably high. And at a given sun position, the pattern of the angle of polarization of the foggy and uh, cloudy sky should be similar to that of the clear sky. So they did a lot of uh, work on this. It was uh, one of their papers was published in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society, another one in Journal of the Optical Society of America. And they showed that the measured uh, polarization uh, and uh, angle patterns of Arctic uh, foggy and cloudy skies when the sun was invisible was sufficient with uh, uh, reasonably sufficient to conclude that uh, both under foggy and cloudy conditions, these conditions are met under both clear skies and foggy conditions. So in sunlit fog, the Vikings could have navigated by polarization if the amount of degree of polarization from the foggy sky was sufficiently good. So, okay, so, so far I've established one of the conditions that is the clouds, the cloudy sky, even if it is very foggy and all that, you can measure the polarization. Now, how good, now obviously the Vikings didn't have sophisticated polarimeters to measure this, but they could use your eye. Now, the human visual system, under some conditions, can detect a single photon of light, okay? Uh, and in fact, there have been a number of experiments shown that under, again, certain conditions, all you need is, on a statistical average, anywhere from three to seven photons to be absorbed, okay? For you to say, you know, respond physically that I see a spot of light, I see a flash of light. So the human visual system is extremely, extremely sensitive. You have to be dark adapted and all that, but you know, but you can detect under some conditions. And in fact, people have done single unit, uh, single, they've taken single photoreceptor, stuck an electrode in it, and have a photon source that sends out one photon at a time, and I've recorded impulses from it. It's about one picoamp, and, but it can still be recorded, and you can still sense it. So, another physicist, by the name of Weber, uh, uh, showed that the differential sensitivity of the human eye, it's, in fact, it's a very fundamental law in sensory science, it's called Weber's law, basically says that you can, your differential sensitivity, what do I mean by differential sensitivity? Let's say that I have a background of light, a patch of light. And on top of that patch of light, I put another small spot of light whose intensity is just slightly different from the background. These two intensities can be less than 1% different. And you can still say, this patch is different from the other patch. Okay? That is really, really, uh, it's less than 1%. In fact, it's much lower than 1%. Um, but for our purposes, 1% is pretty good. So you can, you can discriminate patches of light that have contrast variations that are less than 1%. I'm, instead of using intensity, I'm using contrast because you can have dark patches also. I could have a dark patch and then on top of it, uh, it put another patch which is slightly lower or higher than the background patch, and you can still discriminate between the two. You have incredible uh, discrimination ability. So, oh, by the way, this was a paper in Nature that uh, someone brought to my attention last week, which was quite interesting. This particular species of spider has got two different optics, two different eyes to look at the ordinary and the extraordinary rays of light, very much like our observer with the calcite crystal looking at the O ray and the E ray. Um, so, what type of experiment would you do? I can take a piece of uh, uh, calcite, I can then put in a, uh, you know, put a, 
uh, um, a mask over one edge of the calcite crystal with a very, very small opening. And I can look at the ordinary ray and the extraordinary ray. And in fact, the top figure shows you the type of opening. And the bottom shows you two gray images. They're going to be less in intensity. I can rotate my calcite crystal. And at a particular point called the isotropy point, both the ordinary ray intensity and the extraordinary ray intensity will be equal. OK? So you can determine very easily where that isotropy point is going to be. What does this have to do with navigation? I'm coming to that. Now, instead of, uh, instead of having a screen with a small hole in it, I can just put a black dot on one face of the crystal and still be able to do this. There's a very uh, important uh, theorem in optics called Babinet's principle, which says that uh, you can reverse and it will still be the same. You'll find the same effects. So by invoking Babinet's principle, I, instead of uh, Instead of a, a slide with a small hole in it, I can just put a, paint a small black dot on one face of the crystal, and I can look through the other side at the ordinary and extraordinary rays. So I think having told you about the inter discrimination in uh, sensitivity of the eye and this, you can probably guess where I'm going to next, which is this. Uh, I, light is coming from the sky. And uh, it's horizontally polarized. I can put a commercially available polarizer in there. And, I and here's the detector. And I can rotate my crystal and show that the isotropy point, uh, 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 rotate the, I'm sorry, I can rotate my polaroid and show how the intensity is going to vary. Now this row here uh, corresponding to 0.06, is a measure of the amount of degree of polarization of the light that's coming in. Now I can then remove the Polaroid, put in my uh, calcite crystal in here, and rotate the calcite crystal. If I rotate it at 45 degrees to the crystal axis, both the E ray and the O ray will have the same intensity, so my detector will read the same intensity. OK? so. Uh, this is the, uh, so this is what uh, I'm going to do. So th this basically shows you theoretical curves calculated. You can apply something called Malice's law and so on. And you can calculate what it's going to be, uh, what the intensities are going to be for various degrees of polarization. Uh, that's what the rho equal to 0 0.6, 0 0.4, and all correspond to. And show that for a crystal, rotated at various degrees. At 45 degrees of the crystal, you get a minimum where the E ray and the O ray have the same intensity. So these are the relative intensities on either side of the isotropy point. So it's a function of the angle of the rotation of the crystal. And here again is the photographs showing on top. On one side, you see the two images with the, with the black rectangle, uh, with the rectangle spur patch. On one side of the isotropy point, the bottom figure shows on the other side. And at the isotropy point, they both have equal brightness. If you know the isotropy point, you can detect where the light is coming from. And uh, this basically shows you uh, sensitivity to, instead of uh, patches, I can just put in a, put in a um, you know, black line and do the same kind and show you that it works. Um, this is fine. I've shown you all kinds of theory. How does it work in experiments? So we took a bunch of uh, basically naive observers, gave them these calcite crystals. And the rho equal to 0.08 corresponds to these experiments were done in France. And uh, 0.08 corresponds roughly to cloudy English Channel weather. Uh, polarization. And the theoretical curves were calculated from equations derived from optics. And we basically had observers rotate the crystal 
on either side of the isotropy point and the, at the isotropy point, and you find that there's a pretty good match between theory and experiments. So how would the Vikings have used it, and how does Heidinger's brushes have helped? Remember, I told you that uh, if you look at the Heidinger's brushes, the yellow bow tie basically tells you in what direction the source of light is going to be. Okay, because a plane of polarization is going to be perpendicular to the bow tie. So one could take, if you have unpolarized light or partially polarized light coming in, you could, uh, uh, it goes through, it gets scattered out here and you are standing directly under the scatterer. You get horizontally polarized light. You keep your calcite crystal and you uh, rotate it around the isotropy point. At the isotropy point, the crystal really acts as a depolarizer. So the, you won't see a Heidinger's brushes phenomenon uh, 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 in, the, in the center of your eye, the fovea. But if you quickly you know, move your calcite crystal, you know, if that's the source of light, I'm looking at it through here, uh, I'm looking at the E-ray and O-ray, and then I move it, and I'll be able to see the polarization pattern with hiding this brushes on the fovea. And, the, and if I move this back, I'll get the uh, brushes pattern, you know, uh, 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 will disappear with this because the uh, calcite crystal acts as a depolarizer at the isotropy point. And the orientation of the uh, bow tie pattern tells you the direction of the sun. This is nice, this is nice theory. I, uh, you know, I'm a theorist, I like theories. Would it work? And in fact, my colleagues actually built a device, uh, a little wooden thing with an arrow on it where you can rotate the calcite and, uh, you know, did measurements. What they did was, remember, in the cold, frigid Arctic, most of the time, the sun is going to be near the horizon. And <clears throat> so they went and took a bunch of people and did measurements. And uh, this was with a nice calcite crystal. Now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some historical calcite crystals. Uh, that, the bottom figure, shows a calcite crystal recovered from the bottom of the English Channel uh, uh, called the Alderney crystal. What the Alderney crystal is, is in Alderney on the English Channel, there was a big shipwreck uh, uh, during the time of the Spanish Armada of the coast of Brittany actually. Uh, there was a big shipwreck and the archeologists who who went through the shipwreck and salvaged it, actually discovered that there was a crystal uh, mounted next to the navigation area, uh, okay? And that is what you see on top. Um, so, but it was pretty, uh, it was pretty much opaque. You know, it was all clouded over and all that. So. Maybe there is archaeological evidence for calcite crystals used on board ships. Now, this is the first crystal discovered that's incontrovertibly associated with a ship and was found near a pair of navigation dividers. So this was done by Steve Wright of the Alderney Maritime Trust, the site of, again, like I said, around the time of the 15th, 16th century. And uh, out here, this is approximately about, you know, five to uh, 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 five centimeters long and, you know, and it has been in seawater for over 400 years. So my colleagues, it still has the nice rhombohedral geometry that you find in a crystal of this sort. So my colleagues, basically what they did was, the, even though the transparency is reduced, they took a nice uh, crystal, normal crystal, they kind of sanded it and, uh, and, uh, and immersed it in seawater for a few weeks, and the sea was the result, okay? 
basically, there's a lot of uh, large particle scattering, and uh, so which is why uh, the transparency has been reduced. So, and they did a bunch of materials testing on it. They they confirmed experimentally that Alden crystal is calcite uh, or Icelandic spar. Uh, they looked at its mechanical conservation properties and so on. And uh, they were able to show that even though calcite is rather fragile, if it has been immersed for centuries in seawater, the crystal loses its transparency because of what is called me scattering. And there are ion exchange uh, real problems, but the rhombohedral geometry is preserved. And that you could have used it uh, uh, you know, rather accurately in determining position of the sun. How do you do that? Again, uh, we did experiments with human observers. Essentially, what we did was at the given latitude and all that, you, there are tables you can consult which will tell you at various times where the sun position was. That's what the white line is. And we had a number of ordinary people who had no big training in navigation, but told them what to do with their calcite crystal. And you see the uh, experimental data. The straight white line, the sun azimuth, is from navigational tables because we know at that uh, latitude where the sun position is, and this was the, uh, and even after sunset, during twilight hours we could do that, and even after sunset, under uh, cloudy conditions, we could still see that observers are quite good at predicting where the sun is going to be. The error bars on these are approximately a degree to three degrees, which is pretty good accuracy. So an Alderney-like crystal permits the observer to follow the azimuth of the sun far below the horizon with an accuracy as great as plus or minus one. It doesn't take very long to teach someone how to do it. Therefore, using sunstone, or what we presume is calcite, it's possible to build a sundial that points to the direction of the sun. And this ties in back to that wooden uh, 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 device that I uh, told you earlier. Uh, this is just an experiment that uh, my colleagues being French, you know, tried to do it in Paris. Same, you know, light source, a mirror, and a calcite crystal. And, you know, um, we got a lot of publicity for this paper, and uh, 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 a newspaper in, I think, Sydney even had this cartoon about it of these Vikings holding a calcite crystal and rotating it around. So, what are the arguments for using, uh, for saying that this is probably what the sunstone is and this is what they used? One is, it's from all the sagas that you know, the king looked about and saw no blue sky, then the king took up the sunstone and held it up, and then he saw where the sun beamed from the stone. That's from one of the Viking sagas. You get the best polarization near the horizon. So, and of course, you know, at high latitudes, the sun remains for a long time close to the horizon, which produces the best skylight that you need, per skylight polarization pattern. Uh, light fog and overcast of thin clouds doesn't eliminate skylight polarization. I showed you some of the data from Horvath. Oops. <coughs> Oops, sorry. And because of linear perspective, a bank of clouds of uniform density squeeze together when looking far away. So, you know, that helps. And uh, so it's much easier to find a clear patch of sky toward the zenith. And you can also not be bothered by crepuscular rays that are difficult to see. Method seems to work even when the sun uh, was several degrees below the horizon, but still illuminating the atmosphere. Even at twilight, like the data I showed you, when the sun is below the horizon by about two degrees, its location is difficult to ascertain, but you can still do it with using calcite. And observers can learn the method very easily. It doesn't require lots of training. Against? There are arguments against it too. What is the exact identity of the sunstone? We assume it's calcite, doubly refracting crystal. Okay, people have suggested other types. Like I told you, coderite was, a, was an example that was given, but it absorbs at different wavelengths. We have not to date found any evident, direct evidence of calcite crystals in Viking shipwrecks. That's probably the biggest against. 
the, uh, the evidence I gave you from Alderney was only circumstantial, that maybe, you know, because compasses, uh, there could be variations in magnetic fields and so on, and compasses were unreliable. Maybe they used even at uh, the time of the Spanish Armada, these calcite crystals as a secondary tool, a navigational tool. They could have only gone on their navigation, uh, navigated only during summer months. That's possible. And most probably, Viking sailor would have used any large number of uh, clues from the sky and ship. Like, for example, they could have taken uh, measurements of the sun position at different times and extrapolated. You know, we don't know. But at least on the basis of physics, on the basis of optics, this seems like a nice argument to make. Um, here are some references if you are interested. A general reference on Vikings is this book by Oliver, which is excellent. In fact, I'm reading it now. Um, there are a couple of other references. The Vikings, the North Atlantic Saga is the one from Smithsonian. And there's another new exhibit which hasn't come to the US yet. It's now at the British Museum in London, which is supposedly the largest Viking exhibit uh, ever. And I'm hoping to see it next month when I'm in London. Uh, it's, and the, uh, but the uh, guidebook for it is published by Cornell University Press. These are the couple of papers that we have published on this, uh, one in Europhysics Letters and one in the Proceedings of the Royal Society. Here's another one on polarization sense in human vision. And this is the paper on the Alderney crystals. And lastly, in terms of navigation, in general, Carlson's book, Secrets of Viking Navigation, is pretty good. Um, I'd like to thank my colleagues, uh, Albert and Guy, and various websites. And this is a commercial break. Next year, <laughs> next year has been declared by the United Nations to be the International Year of Light. Now, light and optics is an enabling technology that's used in almost all of our modern civilization. And we hope you know, that there'll be a lot of public outreach on optics next year. And um, lastly, thank you for your attention. Yeah.